Hi, everybody. I'm Olivia F. Scott, the assistant professor of advertising at Loyola University, New Orleans, founder of Elmer's Alliance's marketing consultancy, and the creator and host of Behind the Ad. Thank you so much for joining us today. So listen up. I have a story to tell you. Did you just lean in like I leaned in? If you did, you have proven me right. You see, one of my guilty pleasures before bedtime every night is TikTok. And while I try to limit my time on the platform before bed, every time I get into a rabbit hole of storytelling. Often, it's the rabbit holes that get me deeper and deeper, and I know that I am not alone. Because storytelling is an ancient form of communication and history bearing, which has been around since the beginning of time, many teachers like me and speakers use it to engage their audiences, as well as marketers seeking to engage their audiences, most often to take the desired action they want them to take. So typically, it's more effective than just talking at someone. It's a form of entertainment, of two-way entertainment. So today, I am absolutely thrilled to have a Loyola University journalism alum and respected communications executive with over four decades of experience telling stories of New Orleans through her various work with the Times Picayune, Oshner, View Orleans, the McDonald's restaurants, and many other properties and initiatives. In fact, Karen is the 2024 Loyola University Doc Laborde Ethical Entrepreneurship Award winner. She is the first ever woman in the history of Loyola offering this particular award to win, and we're so excited to have her here with us today. We're excited to hear why storytelling is so important to her and to learn from her the very best practices on telling stories which have respect for the subject and their respective cultures that also engage and inspire people. So without any further ado, please help me join to Behind the Ad Karen Nabone Coxum. Karen. Hi. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for joining us. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, I'm so happy you're here. You're an alum. How's it feel being back at the school? How long have you how long has it been to be? I purposefully am wearing the college's colors. Yay. So I picked out a maroon sweater yes. and gold jewelry because the colors of Loyola are maroon and gold. We appreciate you so much. And how must you feel about winning? the Stock Laborde Entrepreneurship Award, the Ethical Entrepreneurship Award. I just want to start with that and just give you all the honor and, and just praise for that Thank accomplishment. Thank you. What I love about any awards that are given to anyone is that it actually educates and brings those awards to the public, not just for the honoree who's receiving the award, but it gives the... Um, the organization's an opportunity to tell about why those awards are so important. Mm. And that's the best part of it that I that I see, that every time someone gets an award, anyone can find out about what that award is for. Uh. So I think that's one of the best things about those awards when they're given out, not just to the honoree, but what it means to the community. What does this award mean to the community? Well, ethical entrepreneurship when you are when you have ethics in your business that's one of the best things that you could possibly have yep. to be looked upon as a, a good employer dealing with your employees and your community with ethics yes and that's that's extremely important you're just, you're just not doing business just to say I'm a business person you're doing it with the thought behind it about why you are doing what you do so I think that's very important. Well, congratulations. I know you've worked with many businesses, and most recently with McDonald's here in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So congratulations to Thank you for you. winning. You are an OG, as my, my nieces say. You're an OG onto your OG. So you're an OG in this content marketing world. I think, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a huge over-consumer of TikTok. I love all the stories. But these stories have been happening forever. So... I want you just to share with us, having started in the newspaper world and even beyond then, how do you think storytelling has changed since you started and what has stayed the same? Um, a lot has changed in the way that we can now access the stories. You know, a lot, almost everything's online now, but just a point of reference, if you go to anyone's website, just about anyone, any organization, any company's website, there's one little tab on that website that says Our Story. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you can find out, of course, of course, Googling, you can find out about almost anything or anyone 
from the internet. So I, my advice would be for you to fashion your own story. Mm-hmm. Write it down, print it, make it accessible, um, because you have to tell your own story. Mm-hmm. And the proverb that pops into my brain all the time is the African proverb is the lion, if the lion does not give his side of the story, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. So we all need to tell our own story as accurately as we can because somebody is going to come across it mm-hmm. and that, that will give someone an insight into the persons that we are. So I think that's very important. And when you talked about your own story, what triggered for me was your own voice, finding your voice. Was it difficult for you to find your voice? Was there a process for you to actually find Karen's voice to show up in the way that you show up today in writing and in storytelling, or did it come just naturally over time? I think uh, it comes naturally. Um, a lot of people who know me um, know that I do tell stories, mm-hmm. and I involve people, and they say I never meet a stranger, I've never met a stranger, and I, I may over-talk sometimes, you know, which is not a bad thing, but I'm doing that because I want to engage um, and have a conversation with with people that I'm, I'm with. Damn. And I think you learn from that. And that's the main reason that I do that. So well, I want to go back to your history as a journalist. Mm-hmm. Tell me about why journalism and storytelling is so natural to you and what you love about storytelling. It started at home where a lot of things start. Um, my parents, who I thought about it a few days ago, that I don't ever remember in my childhood not ever being with my parents any day of the year. Hmm. We were always together, whether it was um, school, home, the few trips we may have made. So the things that we enjoy coming up uh, with my siblings is that my mother talked to us a lot, but my father told us stories. And we would sit on the curb at home waiting for him to come home from work, jump into his truck, and he would take us to get ice cream. Not every day. Okay. Um, but he would tell us stories, and he was an avid reader and, you know, really liked to read. And, and it rubbed off, as most people who know me know, that um, the stories and even jokes, but jokes are stories also. But yes. And it's in their own places. And um, we just would sit, a, sit at his feet and just listen. And a lot of the things we thought were Bible history, <laughs> and they weren't, but, and going to school and um, always involved in writing for any of the um, newspapers. I was an editor of the yearbook and newspaper at St. Mary's Academy. Okay. And I had um, a journalism class, as did my sister um, before me. And um, that's where Loyola came in because Loyola came to our high school and recruited and was talking about some of the things that would be op- would be offered to to uh, college students. So of course, you know, attending Loyola, I majored in journalism. So it just progressed through the years, and I was, it was something I was very deeply involved with. And when I say involved with writing, mm-hmm. and um, I was also on the on the maroon staff here at Loyola. So it it advanced from high school to college and, of course, my career. Okay, so that's where you started. So I mentioned Times Picayune, Mm -hmm. Oshner, and View Orleans as places where you created or curated stories. Why do you enjoy the art of storytelling? Storytelling involves the listener or the reader. Um, You can engage someone even better when you tell them a story. Mm -hmm. It resonates with what you want to tell them. Because if you just say, don't do this or don't do that, if you tell someone why or yeah. you explain why in a story, it's almost like songs are stories. They right. just put to music. That's right. And, and we often say, well, why can't we teach our kids things in school with music through mm-hmm. music? Because they remember the lyrics of the songs before they remember some of the things that they read in their books and things that the teacher told them. Mm. But when you tell someone a story that connects them, they, they, they take it in and they will remember it better and they will uh, appreciate that it, something that was told to them rather than told at them, speaking at them instead of telling them a story to get them involved in, in, in what it is you're trying to tell them. So that's very you know, interesting to me. So Karen, 
I want to just say something. I never thought about it till you just said that songs are actually stories. Mm -hmm. I have grown up my entire life reading lyrics. I'm a huge lyrics mm -hmm. person, and you're right, especially like country music, mm -hmm. you know, people mm -hmm. who really mm -hmm. write. Fascinating. Thank you for sharing mm -hmm. that with me. But moving on, I want you to tell us your all-time favorite story, right, that you might have created, okay. whether it was personally or whether it was professionally. Um, it was it was professionally, but it, it, it came from my personal connection to my high school. Okay. Um, when I got hired at the Times-Picayune, there was a, a magazine called the Dixie Roto. People from New Orleans who grew up here will remember that insert in the Sunday newspaper. Okay. And as a staff writer with the Times-Picayune, I was given the opportunity to write a feature story for the Dixie Roto magazine. And I was trying to wonder what I could write about. And Dixie Roto did pages and pages on an article, not just a paragraph, not just a couple of pages. The story that I wrote, and with the help of the Sisters of the Holy Family that let me borrow pictures of the school, I wrote the history of St. Mary's Academy from its beginning at um, Bourbon and Orleans, which mm -hmm. a lot of people now know is the Bourbon Orleans Hotel. Okay. So the history of the school, pictures that they lent to me, um, people that I interviewed, it, it ended up being eight pages in the magazine. And a lot of times people are not given that much space to tell a story. Mm -hmm. And stories have beginnings and middles and ends. Mm -hmm. And what's beautiful about this to, to me is that there was an end to the story, but the school and the Sisters of the Holy Family, the Bourbon Orleans is still here. We're all still here. So there's no end to the story of what the sisters continue to do through the school. And I was just always very proud of, of that particular story because you know it allowed me to really get into the history of something and the impact that was made. And um, it, it took a minute you mm, know, to get it done. But when it was published, um, I was so excited. I don't have it anymore. Katrina took it because oh. I had clippings of it. But I, I remember almost every word of it. And it was called Ballroom of Histories because of the ballroom at the, at the Bourbon Orleans Hotel. That sounds, which is now the Bourbon Orleans Hotel. That is beautiful, and I can see why you would feel so proud. Mm -hmm. Is it digitized at all? Can anyone find it? Um, I probably, we probably would be able to find it at the New Orleans Public Library. Can you share any great stories that you learned along your trajectory, your journey that inspired your writing? Oh my, that's a lot. That's, that's loaded. <laughs> Um, because, um, like I said, growing up and having, especially my dad, talk to us so much. Mm. He told us the history of his family. He told us mm. things that he did as a, as a young man. He told us things that he did at work. He told us people he met at work. And I got to meet these people, people that, him. that my dad worked with oh. and um, as an adult and professionally. And they remembered him. Huh. And... Um, that was real special to me, and um, I would like to impart that with um, with my family. I think I've, I'm one of one of the many storytellers in my family and joke tellers in my family. And my granddaughter, um, when she was younger, she would ask me, you know, to tell her stories to help put her to sleep. And yes. I, I really enjoyed that, and I thought that was so sweet of her to, to say, tell me another story, tell me about, you know, your mom, tell me about your dad. And I got to tell her about her, her family, about her grandparents, and, and um, I, I just think that's so important to, to know and to share in a way that somebody enjoys it and looks forward to it. So you are a master of storytelling. Are there any no's to storytelling? Um, I think you should try to impart as much of fact, not truth per se. Truth is important, don't get me wrong, but fact because these stories get repeated. Okay. And like the little game in school when the kids play gossip and it starts off and it ends up being something else. Stories get repeated. And, of course, even today um, there are some discrepancies in what people see and hear and read right. about in the media on online and and it could be something misconstrued that didn't mean to be negative but ended up being negative 
and I was th that makes me think about a, a national, very, very popular television commercial that was the story about um, a, a cereal. And everybody said, give it to Mikey, you know, he'll eat it. Mm -hmm. and, and actually the story is Mikey didn't like anything. So his brother said, give it to Mikey, and if he likes it, you know, then then they've got we got a winner. And right. they said, Mikey, he likes it. But he liked it. So his brother said, Well, it's okay if Mikey liked it. So that's kind of the way that things happen and you know, the urban legends and things like that. So I think accuracy as best as possible. Um, because you can get caught up want to entertain and make something funny and make something fun. Mm -hmm. Um, but remember that somebody might repeat that story. So Correct. it's always really good to try to be as accurate as you could be. Being fact-based, a little yeah, bit of fact-based. Yeah. So kind of dovetailing with that answer, do you have a process or any advice for our students here, people who may be watching who want to craft effective and engaging stories, to either engage an audience or to engage like customers? Know your audience. That is extremely important. Okay. Um, joke telling is, um, is, is, has been with us and will be here. Um, and I love to tell jokes and stories. If you don't know your audience, the joke is definitely going to bomb. And then that's where I think you have the, um, the, the implications of it being a bomb because jokes can bomb. Mm -hmm. And if you tell an inappropriate joke to the wrong audience or the, to the wrong person and you wonder why they're not laughing, you know, if you if you don't know something about that person or something about some something about them, then don't don't do it. Right. You know, don't tell the joke. Just just talk to them instead, because there's a lot of um, you know things that can happen when you when you tell an inappropriate joke. So Correct. that's always important because it's not that you try to be funny because you think it. You know, if somebody else laughed about something, but somebody else may not take that as as something laughable. So. That's smart. I got mm -hmm. it. Thank you for that. Very, very good advice. So a couple more questions for you. Mm -hmm. So View Orleans, when I met you, you mentioned View Orleans mm -hmm. to me, and I understand there are lots of stories that are told there. Can you tell us more about View Orleans and some of the stories that are told there? Mm -hmm. And also tell us about your role with View Orleans and what it is, where it is. Yeah. View Orleans is an interactive attraction that is incorporated into the building of the Four Seasons Hotel, which just recently opened about three years ago. Okay. New Orleans opened about two years ago. And um, the entrance to it is on the second floor. And then it also takes you up in an elevator to the 34th floor of the Four Seasons Hotel and Residences building. And then also the 34th floor, which is the city's only 360 degree obs observation deck. Mm. Blue Orleans, um, and of course the, the developers and the co-developers and the Four Seasons development team, which included includes, you know, my husband Henry and his partners with Blue Orleans went on fact-finding missions to develop the stories and the design of the attraction. Hmm. And the treasure trove of what's there is phenomenal. Hmm. And um, it talks about the history of the city and the cultural bearers that we have, the historians that we have, people who have gone before us, people who are with us now, in, a, in the best storytelling way you can. Things are, you can listen to things, you could read things, things are in three languages, Spanish, French, and English. Mm. They are closed captioning wherever possible. Um, visual, interactive, touchless. Um, it, 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 the walls talk, we say, because there are things on every inch of the walls in the entire attraction from the second floor up to the 34, 33rd, 33rd floor and 34th floor. Um, it is the best introduction to the city as, the, as far as having everything in one place that you could experience. So we encourage um, a lot of the marketing, and I'm on the marketing team, is that this is one of the better, better, um, introductions to the city that would introduce a visitor visitor to the city but but remind local and residents that may not be local about the vast amount of history that New Orleans holds deep in its heart 
and um, in in a way that is so entertaining that I mean you could spend hours and days there. I can't wait. You know? I can't yeah. wait to go. Yeah. You've been telling me I need to go. Yeah. The history chronicle there starts from when and goes up to when. Is it like it, it's it's current? And in the Current. music okay. section, um, where you can listen to music through the eras and the different genres include, um, of course, jazz. And and we also have Big Freedia, you know, doing. Well, then I'm there. You know, bounce. I do and anything. So, where I go and, wherever and you can listen to all of all of this and in, 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 in at your visit. So you can okay. go through the almost the history of music in New Orleans in one visit. Thank you so much. You've been very inspiring and shared some really good nuggets for our students and for all of our viewers and everybody who's watching today to understand about storytelling. So thank you so much thank you. for being here with us and congratulations again oh, on winning you. the Doc Laborde Award. So thank you everyone who's joined us today on Behind the Ad. We hope that you will find your voice and also find the courage to tell your own story. As Karen said earlier, making sure that all stories have a little bit of truth. It's okay if we kind of you know, exacerbate certain things, but make sure you have your truth and you tell your story. No one else will tell your story quite like you. We look forward to seeing you on the next edition of Behind the Ad. See you later.